Forbes India Leadership Awards. I think I was given some questions, so I maybe I'll address those questions. And one of the first questions came to me was, give us some anecdotes in your early stages uh, when you started working. And I started working at a very young age of 20. I built up the business from bottoms up and, you know, I joined the family organization which was uh, located in the heart of commodity markets in Masjid Bandar. I don't know how many of you have been to Masjid Bandar. If you have not been, you should try and go there. It's, uh, it's very crowded, very dirty. You can't get parking place. Just to enter the office, it's a big task. And uh, I was in the process of recruiting talent. 50% of the time when I call people for interview, they would just run away before entering the office. Why should I go and work in an organization where the office is located in such terrible location, you know? So how do you, as an entrepreneur, you never give up. So I changed my tax and, you know, I started calling them to one of the best places in Bombay, the Willingdon Club, which is very nice. So call them once, twice mentally prepared them that, okay, it's a matter of time, we'll move out of the Masjid Mandar. And I think that worked. So, a small incident, but I think it, it sends a message that, you know, you as an entrepreneur, you don't give up. One more example I would like to give is, you know, when I started building the business, I had to travel in interior markets, unlike your business, which is done through <laughs> online. We had to go to small villages, appoint distributors, and I would we didn't have any professionals, I just took a car and start, started, I remember I started from Nagpur and went to all the small, small towns, appointed distributors, started retailing in. Those days, there were no hotels in small towns, so I have appointed distributors and stayed with them in the night, you know, in their house. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, then you have to find some ways to resolve issues. And one big issue which I resolved, which was really big, it took me two to three years to resolve, was uh, when, uh, you know, I was trapped from different angles. It was a family managed organization. My father, three of his brothers, by then four of my cousins had joined business. And it was very, very difficult to manage with so many family members in terms of freedom to recruit talent. Uh, it was perceived to be a family managed organization. So how do you separate that from that time, the Bombay Oil Industries, with having different businesses with so many family members and go into a dedicated consumer product business under Marico. And it took me two to three years and many a times, you know, people think that you have to move fast. But in a family managed organization, and for those who are family, it, it's worth spending that time to arrive at a consensus. To me, that has been the most important decision in my life. If I had taken up a fight with them, I would still have been fighting with them. But this was a consensus decision. It was not a ownership separation. It was just a management separation. Wherein I just said that give me freedom to operate this business in a different company. I don't want any extra ownership stake. And at some stage, you know, I was able to succeed. So I would say these are the two, three broad areas in my initial days of working, which, uh, which made a big difference. And I've, I've gone through the entire book. I've read your book. So... I'm pretty much familiar of how the story and Rishabh being a very good friend. Yes. Uh, but we keep on learning from you. I mean, our, our journey is very small, five year old. But I think one of the anecdotes for, uh, for us was when, when we used to raise capital. We were, we were bootstrapped for a while and then we raised some capital in between. We were asked always that, has someone done this globally? And we kept on asking back that, how would someone do this in India for the first time, if we keep on asking this question. Let us figure out if somebody has done similar to what we are trying to do in, uh, in India. And you know, we went back and tried to map everything and single ingredient is, is just a buzzword right now, but historically India, coconut, I mean, it's a single ingredient. If you look at Himalaya, it's neem. almond, right? So when we went back and start telling that, you know, we just don't want to look for the global examples of it, however fancy they might sound in a financial model, we're going to look for inspiration in the country and uh, the way uh, large uh, in traditionally or, or earlier things have been done, we would want to just change the operating way of doing it and 
probably try to follow the path of how probably America has done and we we still uh, far far away from <laughs> but yeah. but you are on the right track my son is uh, an investor and he i was told today i didn't even know that he had invested 2.5% of his company stake is with my son yes. and he talks so highly of you and when he knew Thank that you. i was going to meet you today he's saying that fantastic you know because he's saying these guys have done amazing work and they are going to go miles so Thank he is a very happy investor i think his stock has appreciated quite a lot but yes. he's looking at much more appreciation absolutely but uh, i heard your co-founder yesterday at another seminar and i think i i thought it was just coffee but when he talked about caffeine which includes tea coffee and cocoa yeah. so you used all these three ingredients to uh, to develop your products and that's a wide range i yeah. thought only coffee by itself is maybe limiting but if you combine these three you have a wide yeah. base to operate upon yeah. and the world runs on caffeine yeah. tea coffee chocolate yeah. may everything kind of comes along so we yeah, we believe exactly. it's going to be yeah yeah so i think the next question which came to me was have you and how do you identify opportunities uh to expand the business now this is a very relevant question for entrepreneurs what i do is i do a lot of outside in which means what's happening internationally as you rightly put it you studied some ingredients so what are the trends especially in consumer products which are happening whether it's natural trend or vegan trend or whatever trend which is is coming in the protein trend uh read a lot interact a lot with thought leaders uh listen a lot so that's the outside in you know in terms of finding out what is working where but that doesn't give you a true opportunity i think based on that then you decide whether is there an opportunity for you to leverage something with the consumer and that's inside out which means after understanding the opportunities in say food you find out whether you have a unique proposition in healthy foods you know one of our desired or one of our areas is healthy foods you know So I'll just give you an example of oats. We went into plain oats where we had to fight competition from Kellogg's and Quakers, and they are big players and they've been there for years and years. We didn't have any differentiator in plain oats, and we got about 10-15 percent market share because of our brand name Safola and distribution. But after that, what? So we said we have to do consumer insighting. So we went to the consumer and we realized that the consumer Indian consumers preferred a savory breakfast not a sweet breakfast. And then we went into each and every state because each state has a different taste profile. So can we design an offering for different for each state and offer them in savory oats. So we have masala oats, pav bhaji oats, uh tomato pepper, pongal oats. and we have created a some like i think 300 crore category in last 4 5 years we have 80% market share so the key thing is combine those trends with a lot of innovations consumer insighting and develop something which works with the consumer and continuously be in touch with the consumer i think consumer i am sure you are also doing the same thing and you know your way of consumer insighting is fast far more quicker than the old age kind of fmcg business is where you look get lot of trends through online data and things like that but even if we get 1% of how you collect insights uh, i mean we are sorted uh, in in our case i think uh, one of the biggest opportunity area is how do we read millennials because we are a millennial only brand uh, we want to target we want to speak to them we want to serve them and then the spillover happens to certain other age groups but and in that process one of the one of the things which we start telling ourselves is that we don't understand millennials because you know this is a generation which is changing so fast how do you claim that it is there you understand so we have we have this large vertical which only speaks to the first years to the fourth years which is we have we call the caffeine student army this student army educates us at a pace in a spectrum which we could never imagine i mean it's an accelerated mba we do every 3 months from insight collection and one of the anecdotes of that is we wanted to block a celebrity or influencer in the male space we are a gender neutral brand and we did the slicing and dicing the the usual way we did it uh, we could not be convinced no it's not hitting it's not landing for us how do we do we went back to the student army we asked them how should we define don't tell us who how they told us there is a hashtag called man crush monday wherein 
young women crush over their man on a Monday. It has 46.7 million posts, not stories, posts. Hugely popular asset. In India, we took the person who was the top charted MCM hashtag winner and sought it for us. And the kind of engagement that guy is bringing on the table is immense. So I think from an opportunity exploration perspective, we kind of keep our ears there. And again, data uh, sits at the center of everything. So we kind of roll back the data angle to this inside and try to make better decisions as we move forward. The next point is what has been the biggest learning for you in your career, you know? And if I had to look at what worked for me was to get into a business which was leveraging my strengths. Because many times, you know, there's a tendency that, okay, IT is the flavor of the season or digital is the flavor, so you should go into that. I'm completely against that. If I'm not good in technology or if I'm not good in digital, I should not get into that business. But if I'm good in consumer inciting, I'm good in something which is working with distribution sales. So I actually, I went into a business which was leveraging my strengths and that became my passion because it was my strengths and I could excel in that. So I would say that leverage your strengths is the first. Number two, focus. Do a few things, but do them well. So we just went into FMCG and within FMCG, we went into beauty and wellness. And you are not even that, you're just into beauty, so which is good. <laughs> because there are enough opportunities in, in that space itself, you know. And then huge, trust on talent and governance, you know. So I've always looked at talent because without any investment, I converted the whole business from unbranded to branded without any capital investment. And this business doesn't require too much capital. As you know, it's more talent. How do you create a brand? How do you distribute? And that happens through talent. So I have a big believer in improving, continuously improving the quality of talent you have. And governance is one thing which uh, I think many entrepreneurs, they tend to take a shortcut when they're small. And I would strongly feel that one should not take because it will hit you at some other stage. So I'm a big, big believer in, in, uh, in governance. And finally, it's okay to fail. You know, many a times I've failed, but it's important to learn from your failures. So that fear of failure, risk taking, experimentation should not inhibit your growth. It's okay to fail. I've had multiple failures. So don't be afraid of taking a step which because market research cannot give you all the answers. Ultimately, you have to go in the marketplace and test out. Look, before I jump on to my answer, one of the things which I keep on understanding from as we are growing, when you said talent, right? At a, at a philosophical level, how should one think about whether one should make a family while he, is building, he or she is building a company or a sports team? And both have very different le legs and hands of how an organization should be built. Uh, naive so, questions, but, but I think uh, this was something which you are trying to figure out. So I, I, I don't want to combine family with business. In fact, I am the one who actually turned away the family into more professional. Because ultimately, I, I always have one thumb rule. The interest of the organization should come first. The issues of loyalty and all are not relevant because if you try to be loyal to your employees and if they are not good enough, it will impact your business. So I always have this thumb rule. The interest of the organization should come first. Now, depending on the kind of business one is, and you may want to have some family members. For example, if you are in a very high-risk business like taking calls on foreign exchange or uh, buying stocks at, on a, on a, you know, that quick decision making, then you may want to go into more like a family. But in my case, it was a FMCG company and I was looking at examples of PNG and Levers and they were all professional organizations. So I went the other way in terms of professional. And, uh, just to kind of click on the learnings part, I think one of, uh, it's a very limited learning, so to say, but uh, one of the things which we, uh, in the last five years I've learned is that uh, so as a, as a founder, you should be definitely good at sales at least. Uh, you're selling to your team members who should be hired at a certain salary cut because you don't have the money to pay. Uh, your retailers, your investors, you continue to do that. Uh, the entire market, I mean, uh, when I go back to sleep, I think uh, uh, the only thing which comes to my mind is uh, the selling n doesn't stop. So one of the learnings which has been that probably one should, one should continue to sharpen. And second is, and especially in the world where, you know, unicorns are happening probably every week, 
we believe in consumer brands for us uh, and as a core dna that brands take time it's not a it's not a business where you can just shower everything and say that you know now we have created it uh, consumers tend to push back so at the end of the day you uh, nine women can't create a baby in a month so it will take its own time but when it takes i mean it flies on a, at a very different level so be patient is something which we are trying to learn again okay the last point which was given to me was what is the learn you have from this new age businesses like yours you know and i must say the entry of the d2c brands as you put it as you gone into is very different all the entry barriers which we thought existed for us in terms of distribution entry barriers uh, advertising budget entry barriers have gone you can do digital marketing enter you can go online and sell uh, so i think there is a lot to learn and we have looked at it from an opportunistic lens you know it is a threat also so considering that we acquired two brands uh, you are aware that one beard one other is just herbs maybe one more is in the on the way <laughs> and uh, we also have launched two of our online brands but the way we are managing this is very different from the traditional fmcg way of doing things you know we have a very young team completely away from our traditional fmcg marketing team because the mindset required to manage this is very very different so i just want to know from you how how do you see the difference between fmcg and d2c uh, i think uh the digitally native uh, brands have a certain way of working but what we tend to look back and try to learn especially from you guys having certain uh, view point of uh, of the organization i've met koshi uh, i've met sujoth from beardo uh, uh, we i uh, i think the talent part that uh, when we as uh, founders try to create and this is something which we are learning a lot of startups have done well i think creating a very very solid leadership team and as a founder freeing yourself or detaching yourself and in your entire book you have just mentioned one thing people 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 it has to be people right i think that's something which we are trying to learn on how to do it because we tend to kind of freely in a hustle mode hire anyone and everyone second i think systems and processes uh, we genuinely uh, i mean the rule in the startup world is uh, break it right so we believe i think as we are growing from a certain level we have just closed around which will be announced we are feeling it that you know systems and processes should be built first and there has to be a very high degree of focus and which which you guys have kind of uh, still to learn a lot great thank you tarun thank, thank you for interacting with you and thank you for uh, having us as your shareholder and hopefully we'll do you'll do much it's better a, it's a pleasure and it's a great validation and you're on the captable Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Forbes India Leadership Awards 2023.